So you might want to create your own VPC, which is very typical of anything except for pretty basic infrastructures. Often people are creating their own VPCs and not using the default, although the default is okay if that fits your use case. You create a VPC, you give it a name, and immediately you're hit with this to give it a CIDR block, an IP address range to create the VPC with. And then the example has 10.0.0.0.2.4, and that's actually a different IP address range than we saw in the default VPC. So what are the IP address ranges that we can use? If we head over to the docs and see VPC and subnetting for IPv4, which is what we're going to talk about mostly here, we'll see the RFC 1918 has three ranges suitable for private networks. Now, these have uh, large network ranges, so slash 12 prefix and slash 10 or slash 8 prefix. Those actually create large networks. But AWS VPC limits you to slash 16, which is a slightly smaller network, although that's still what we saw, like something like 65,000 IP addresses. So it's quite large anyway. So the three IP address ranges that AWS wants you to use for private networks are the 10.0.0.0 slash 16, 172.3.1.0.0.16, or 192.168.0.0 slash 16 as well. Slash 16 prefix is the largest for that IP address range as defined in RFC 1918. And you can do slash 16 as well if you would like. Okay, so if you do the full IP address range, you get the potential to have up to 65,500 or so resources with private networks in your VPC. That is an insane number that is very hard to reach. Now, there is a downside to using the entire range of all 65,000 addresses in your VPC. And that is if you want your VPCs to communicate with each other, you can do that through something called VPC peering, and VPC peering cannot have overlapping IP addresses. So if you do something like this, and the entire 10.0.0.0 address space is taken, then you can't peer this VPC into a different VPC so they two can communicate over the private network. You can't do that to another one that has the same IP address range. So you could either create a VPC, a different one that has a different IP address range, one of these three, or you can do something like not use up your full IP address range. So for example, if I just do slash 17 here, I'm actually splitting this in half. And that's totally valid. I'll just get half of my total potential VPCs, right? So that's something like, uh, I'm not doing math top of my head, but that's half of 65,000 IP address ranges potentially. So, so let's just go ahead and see that the 10 0 range at slash 16, if we update that. Right, that is 65,500 addresses. If we divide it, no, we can't divide here, or we just do slash 17, which divides it in half. Then we can see it's 32,000 roughly uh, hosts that we can use. So the slash 17 range here is half of the slash 16 range. So we can do something like that. You can go even smaller because 32,000 potential hosts is still a huge number. And you can do something like that. It makes more sense to start with a smaller VPC, just in case you want to do something like VPC peering in the future. Okay, let's see a different example of a VPC that I have here in a different account for Chipper CI. It's a different product I run. This has three VPCs inside of Ohio again, the default, and then one for staging and one for production. So you can see how for Chipper CI here, I have created multiple VPCs and each VPC handles a different environment, staging versus production. They use the full IP address range here because I didn't bother setting up for VPC peering ahead of time which hasn't been an issue for me, and it might not be an issue for you as well. And inside of these VPCs have different setups. Let's go ahead and see the subnets for each one. So if I do subnet ID here, I'll organize by that. And we have different subnet names here. And we have elastic load balancers and apps networks and um, data networks and all that good stuff. And they're different. The ELB ones are designed to have public traffic. So you'll see in the route table, the route table for these will have internet gateways. And the internet gateway, of course, will say that any server added to the subnet will be accessible by the public internet. Now, I have other subnets as well. For example, inside of the data tier, the data tier ones are for private network traffic. So you won't see a internet gateway, but you might instead see a NAT gateway. And the NAT gateway is the thing that's going to allow the uh, private network servers to not be accessible from the public internet, but they can still talk to the outside internet through the NAT gateway, the network area translator. So those servers stay in the private network. The outside world cannot communicate with them, but they can talk to the outside internet so they can do things like app get install and all that good stuff that you might need to do inside of a real server. Okay, so the point of what I'm saying here is that you can create VPCs for all sorts of use cases. In my case, I've created VPCs to 
separate environments. So the production and staging environments can't accidentally communicate with each other. They have subnets, and the subnets are carved up in various ways. I use slash 24 for these. So the variable IP addresses for each is only about 251, which is much smaller, right? They're divided up amongst different availability zones. And each availability zone gets an app subnet, an elastic load balancer subnet, a data subnet, all that good stuff. So I can divide up our, my use cases, so private network stuff for like the data tiers that I might put databases in, stuff for the public tier that I might have there for like the elastic load balancers, for example, stuff that needs to be accessible from the public internet. And those are in every availability zone. So I can spread my infrastructure amongst different availability zones and also uh, amongst the use cases for them. So I might put database stuff into different availability zones, right? And I might put elastic load balancers into multiple availability zones also. Okay, so that's enough about different use cases for VPCs and the IP addresses that we can use with them. Let's go ahead and start talking more about NAT gateways and internet gateways because I've only just kind of briefly touched on them and they deserve a little bit more attention.